Hey, hey everybody. <laughs> okay, we'd like to call the meeting to order, verify compliance with open meeting law notification, and adopt the agenda. We can all please stand for the pledge to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Kathy, did we receive any comments? No, we did not. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to four student staff spotlight, gifts and donations. A is the BCME Award. So we have guests joining us tonight. This is our first time we've had our um, staff spotlight recognition with um, virtual guests. So um, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, and I'll introduce the award a little bit and then ask if they um, want to talk a little bit about that. But um, just so everybody here knows who is on the Google Meet here. So Eric, do you want to start? Absolutely. I'm Eric Gatt. I teach orchestra at the middle and high school level. Um, I also teach music production one and two. Katie? I'm Katie Snyder. I teach uh, band at the middle school and at the high school. Mike Zenz, uh, music teacher primarily uh, in the high school band. I'm Monica Heckenberger. And I teach uh, general music at Hills Elementary. And I'm Caitlin Dahl, and I teach general music at Edgerton Elementary. And that's us. We're not, we're not in the bottom corner. I just realized that. So um, we are here to recognize, um, uh, we posted on our social media, and hopefully you saw that. Um, the um, award that they received is the Best Communities for Music Education. I'd like to um, do a special shout out to Katie Sider, who um, filled out the application, um, collected the information, and it's, it's I wouldn't say it's a, an easy form, but it is a long form, um, and, and had to fill out a lot of information about our district from our student population to everything that it includes, so it is definitely not easy. So a huge shout out for taking that initiative and putting forth that application so we can have that and recognize that. And so it recognizes and celebrates schools and districts that embrace and include music education as part of a well-rounded education. So any of you can jump in on that. And Katie, um, if you want to share a little bit about that, but we're um, very um, proud of the work that all of you are doing and pleased that um, you put forth that effort to fill out that application. And that little logo that we have, um, we're all able to now use that in your email signatures and everything else that we do, and I hopefully, hopefully you display that very proudly um, with the work that you're doing. So I'm going to turn it over to any of you if you'd like to say something, but specifically, Kate, if you want to share anything more about that award. Sure. Uh, like Dr. Olson said, it asks for a lot of information. It's very specific to the district, um, and it's also specific to each one of us. Um, it asks questions like, um, like what our highest level of schooling is. It asks questions about numbers, um, different courses that we offer, and then it also asks questions about the community because it is a best community. So it asks about different arts sort of things that are available in that, in that community. And it also asks about like extra opportunities that students have within the community. else has questions or we didn't officially applaud them but we could do that yeah, a little so more so, so what inspired you to look into this was this something that you had seen before or knew about from other places um, at my last school district we had applied for it there as well um, and it's advertised through NAM which is the National Association for Music Merchants so it's put on by all of them which are the music businesses Very cool. And I know um, Katie just shared, and I think uh, Logan is getting ready to share on social media some of the work. I know they've been trying to organize um, some virtual um, playing of their ensembles, which is very challenging. So thank you all for trying to connect with the students in a very uh, challenge. I know our arts are very hard to do virtually, not as easy as some of our other learning. So the sixth and seventh grade band, I think, just did a, a, a version of Star Wars, and so that was fun to listen to. And I know the rest of you all are working on some, some pieces like that, too, so hopefully we can share that so people can still enjoy our students playing some music even when we're not connected and our concerts are right now not happening. So. Okay. Thank you all. We'll give you the round. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, congratulations and thank you all for your work. <clears throat> Take thank care. You. Bye Thanks. Bye. Thanks for including us in the meeting. You bet. You're welcome. Great rest of your meeting. Also. You too. Oh, we will. <laughs> You're welcome to stick around yeah. if you want. Yeah, you can stay on. Super exciting stuff. We, we have office hours. Yeah, they do. Oh, <laughs> excellent answer. Way to go. <laughs> All right, take care. All right, be well and wash your hands. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So on to 4B donation wrestling program. Yep, so we had a family who just decided they, um, their oldest, uh, they've had two, uh, both of their children have been in the wrestling program. One has been a manager and one was a, an athlete for over eight years and their um, youngest is graduating and decided to make a, a donation of $1,000 to the wrestling program. And so that's what this is, is to acknowledge them. Yep, and thank you to the Nowak family for your time with the, the program and for this donation. It's fantastic. Thank you. Anybody else? So it'll go right to the wrestling program? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, great. Um, on to five, consent agenda. A is approval of May vouchers and vouchers payable. B is approval of April 27th and May 11th, 2020 school board minutes. C is approval of 2020-2021 Charter 220 Interdistrict Transfer yeah. Agreement. D is acceptance of donation to Wisconsin to Whitnall High School wrestling program. I can get through the 2020-2020 thing, but I can't get through Whitnall High School. Um, e approval of personnel recommendations. Would anyone like to remove an item? Yes. C, please. Okay. Would anyone else like to remove an item? So I'll take a motion to approve items A, B, D, and E. So, so move. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Seeing none, motion carries. Karen, go ahead with C. Yeah, since I'm still kind of new to this, I just wanted to ask for a refresher on how this program works, please. Students that are working uh, down in Milwaukee were able to open enroll to any district in the area. I don't know how long ago this goes. Uh, way back. Way uh, back. 70s, way maybe? Yeah. 1970s? Oh, mm -hmm. how far back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so. We pay for transportation. That's essentially the difference between 220 and open enrollment. 220, we have to pay for transportation. Okay. Open enrollment, we don't. Yeah, this was pre open enrollment. It was part of the desegregation parts. Um, it was part of the Milwaukee Public Schools. And um, um, also, the reverse happened. It wasn't just us students from the Milwaukee Public School system coming out to the suburbs. The, all, the uh, yeah. opposite was yeah. also true. There was a uh, an exchange both ways there, so that yep. was part of that whole issue, and that's why it does date back to then. But I think through open enrollment and a lot of other things, and, and the fiscal impact of it, that program has just sort of seen its, you know, it, it has been through it. So it took a while for students who had started in kindergarten to make its way through the system. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, you know, with the youngest student of the remaining are fifth grade next year, fifth grade. Question and then so then it would just kind of become open enrollment would, as yeah, normal. That, that's what the role is okay. essentially. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Then I'll take a motion to approve 5C. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries. On to six action items. <coughs> a is the staff device cycle. Take a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Any questions or comments, discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye
Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. On to B, the all on board video board. Um, before making a motion, we're going to have the discussion uh, due to the uncertainty of last week's meeting and some information that's been found since then. We checked with legal counsel and they said in this case, it's better to have the discussion, determine what the motion will be, then bring the motion forward. So we'll start with the discussion. Does anyone have any follow-up questions before we? Well, Dave was supposed to get back to us. That's so okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so Dave got in touch with everybody and that everyone understands and they're okay. I think there was one that he hasn't yet. Um, okay with what? They're all okay by delaying oh, it for delaying one year. Delaying for a year. So I guess their question is going to be, our motion is to table it or something nope, like that. The motion nope. would be to postpone until sometime before December 1st, 2020, because our 365 day contract we right, discussed MOU. last year yeah. ends at the end of November. So this gives us any time between now and then if factors change, if more donors come through or to discuss it when that contract comes up. And then we talked to the, uh, uh, with that, that products, is we could we could probably be see increase in price. Uh, I think there's always inflationary factors that take place when you wait. Um, I don't. Inflation is pretty low and, and has been, but is relatively low and decreasing by the month right now. That I'd like to think that prices would remain stable, but it's something we can certainly track. else so again the motion will be to postpone the scoreboard conversation and decision and the action until sometime before December 1st 2020 someone set the motion so moved second second okay any other discussion before we vote you want to specify the date in your motion and the one you want to postpone this discussion to well, sometime before December 1st. I mean, do you want to be more specific in your answer? I'm well, no, because we don't know, because okay, factors so could change. Okay, I, donors I could contact us. Specific. Yeah, yeah donors know. could contact us in June, July, or August, and it could cover the difference, and then we can move forward there. But okay. this means that before December 1st, yeah. so we will cover it again. That we yeah, sign. so the downside with waiting looks like we lose the 0% finance which could essentially pay for that first year. Like our first year's covered, second year is like 20,000. It could, could essentially defray that year, but then we'd still be on the hook for the three after if we didn't get any more donors. So at least by waiting, we would lose that $24,000 benefit, but we have more opportunity to hopefully cover all of it and not have the district on the hook for it. The way I see it, it's a good summary. Else? All right, so then all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. On to C, people transportation contract amendment. Uh, and again, after consulting with legal, we can have the discussion before making the motion. Again, based on the conversation from last meeting and new information that's been learned since then. So go ahead, Mike. So, um, if anybody wants me to restate, I, I did send out a memo this week uh, with some additional points to consider. If anyone would like me to restate any of those, certainly in, in a public session, please let me know. Um, but I was, I've been doing quite a bit of back and forth with first student and it kind of picked up a lot today given uh, our discussion tonight. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to go through a few additional points even outside of the memo. I think a really good question that was asked by a board member was how does this contract look for next year given the language that's in there right now and, and given the variables that are in place. So the way that contract reads right now, the contract amendment, is that we would be, no matter the school closure situation, weather or COVID-19 related health emergency, we would be on the hook for 50% of that day that is uh, no longer needed for transportation. Right now, if there's a school closure due to weather, we don't pay. And so this is putting that language 
into the contract amendment that no matter the reason, 50% uh, will be put in. Again, not a crazy uh, demand based on other contracts that are out there. A lot, there are many boards out there that don't have to make this decision at all because <coughs> that language is already in the contract. This would be putting that language in. So if there is uncomfortableness uh, about that particular aspect, uh, I reached out to first, first student and, and simply asked what would, um, what would it look like to put in a contract amendment that essentially ends September 1. In other words, we do pay our 50% as we, as is been put out there by the consortium, but that after September 1, we don't have that language in anymore. For example, what if, what if legislation said there's, there can't be any transportation, there shouldn't be any transportation, to the point brought up, that would mean we're on the hook for 50% of the bill for the remainder of the year. <clears throat> First student responded and said, we would be open to an agreement like that, obviously with the understanding that the main point of the language, this force majeure that's, that's in the contract, we wouldn't want that in place then after September 1 either. That if we say we're only gonna put, we're gonna pay 50% or anything after September 1, either has to be a discussion with the board again um, or or whatever, the, whatever that would look like, that there would be a discussion or we would be able to utilize force majeure language, this is for a student, that would be the compromise that would be made. So from our point of view, um, I like the idea of putting out there that we are covering 50% of the costs. What it is is everything that takes place over the summer. So first student again today kind of reiterated that our summers are the busiest time. This is when we are maintaining buses, this is when we are hiring. This is when we're bringing everything up to code. We are, and, and hiring is not a simple thing. If you don't have that license, we're training, you know, six, seven, eight weeks invested in a particular person. Uh, you've got your routing to consider, which we do. We, we need to get a handle, a good handle on our routing this summer. And then if there is uh, statutory things that come across the transportation, we need to be, be able to deal with first student and not have them go, listen, we've got a time crunch, we've had these districts who have actually paid uh, the, the resources, we need to deal with them first, and then we will get to you when we have the time, because the, the fees or the, the, the purchases have not been made. That's essentially the argument that's being made here. By who? First student. Huh. That's first student's argument. Okay, they told you that we would come, if we didn't choose to pay, we would come last. They told you that straight out. In an email today, I said, what would it look like if we did not pay? And it says, can you speak to this? The school just says, sign the amendment and continue to fund our operations will be prioritized when it comes to drivers, buses, and any other services, routing, charters, whatever. That's, that's the response. Okay. So, that's where I'm landing, is that, to come out more intensely than I did last week, that if, if you told me what should we do moving forward with this contract, I would say we would pay it with language in place through September 1. I don't think we necessarily want to pass that motion tonight. I think we still would want to, um, What's the word? It's not, I don't have this table in my head right now. To postpone to June or July to give us time to, again, work on that exact contract language because in other parts of the contract amendment, they talk about the 2021 school year as well. Um, and so we wanna just tidy that language up um, and then see it again in June. But that's where I would come across as far as my recommendation would be different from the actual motion that's out there right now. Yes. So the benefit of doing as you suggested, where we drop the force majeure contract September 1st, is if this happens again next year, we're not on the hook to pay anything, and we're at the end of our contract, so at the same time we'd be either going with her student or going with someone else, depending yeah. on what things look like. So, so listen, let's say that 
October 15th comes around and we're in a closure situation. Mm -hmm. First student is still gonna approach us in October and say, listen, sure. we need to do this, this, and this. Will you? Mm -hmm. They're gonna bring up the same language. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, we then have a second time to say, well, the situation is this or that, or we have time to respond to specific situations. What I was most concerned about is getting a smooth transition through the summer to the start of the year. Right? I need to be able to have those conversations uninhibited by whatever financial situations are going on and dependent upon what sort of, if there is some crazy transportation stuff that's happening, I need to be able to have those conversations and not be told, hey, listen, we got other districts to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this would at least stop gap us in the summer where if I know transportations as it should be, September, whatever the first day is, that was my major concern. And then you are correct. It's one year left in the contract. If we're in the same situation in March, where they're going now March through June, we're closed with the contract amendment, we're right. We'd be on the hook for 50%. Where here we could say, well, listen, we went out to bid. I mean, maybe we're not even going with First Synergy anymore. Why would we pay 50%? So what does that mean for the rest of the coalition then, the other three districts? Uh, so wh when I pressed on, so it was all part of this, I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to understand what happens if the other three districts approve the contract amendment. Because in the memo, one of my concerns was, what does this mean if Whitnell doesn't? Mm -hmm. And then they say, hey, we just don't have the funds and it's because Whitnell didn't pay. And now we're just gonna, we're not gonna sign any of your contract amendments. That has not come across, at least in, my, in, the, in the conversations today, um, that they, they wouldn't um, stop service to the, to, the entire, to the entire consortium. Whoever pays, that contract language appears to be in place. Whoever doesn't, you're at the bottom of the totem pole, in essence, is what it sounds like. It says, in short, we would still try to provide service next school year. This is saying, what if we couldn't pay? But the <coughs> level and quality of service would be highly compromised with no guarantee of service. And the first student would reserve the right to claim force majeure for any school district that did not sign the amendment on any lapse of service as the COVID-19 closure has left us and I'm making us financial stuff. So nothing states we would close it off to the consortium. It's totally based on who signs the particular contract. Else? Oh yeah, I got, I got a lot. I don't like one bit of these people at all. Of this amendment addendum. <laughs> so they're going to tell us that they're not going to honor the contract. Is what they just said. That's they, exactly what they said. Yes, they would argue that they. No, 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 no. That no, not argue. They said they're not honoring their contract. That's not. As written. That's not fair to say. Why? Because they would, they would use force majeure. That's contract, that's language in the contract. That's utilizing the contract. Okay, so let's read, read force majeure to me. Usually force majeure means if there's an act of God, all bets are off, correct? Yes, we have nothing from legal that says COVID-19 is an act of God. But there's other things in there. Governmental action. So the government has closed schools. Right. That so we go back to our contract and says, and said, that says, we only pay when we use Correct. your service. Correct. So they are not, Correct. they are telling us, they're, if we don't sign this addendum, they're not going to honor their contract. Next We're going to be, pardon? Next year? Yeah. In the fall. Next yeah. year. Of course. And the force majeure wouldn't apply to next year because the schools would be back open. They're, if, well, potentially. The potentially. If they're back open, and then as Quinn said, they don't honor their contract. <clears throat> if they don't have the funds to operate, Quinn, I don't like any part of this either. I just want yeah. to be on the same. Maybe I, I should be I want to be on the you. same side of yeah. you. I, 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 I should be directing. I'm talking I, to the rest of the members. No, here. If I can save the district 180 versus 90, I would much rather do 180. And I don't like paying for, <coughs> not paying for a full service, but that's not what's happening okay. here. Okay, I, I, let's be clear. But I need to be aware of what all the different circumstances are. If uh, if they would come. They being first student would say, listen, an act of God, COVID-19, a governmental action, whatever it is, closed down operations for three months. 
we don't have all the funds to get operations in order for you by September 1, I think that is a valid argument according mm -hmm. to the contract language. But I have nothing from legal that says this governmental action force majeure could be in place. Uh, th that, so that's have, a valid have, we to, have we discussed this with legal? I have not discussed it with legal. All we have is from Greendale, where they, in, they <coughs> used, utilized their contract, their um, legal, to craft the current contract that you see in here. The current and their, Correct, the contract amendment. And that they felt it appropriate to make sure force majeure language is out because of it possibly being used in this situation. Okay, so you're, you're, you're suggesting that from what I read, that we should sign the addendum. I'm suggesting that we, if, if you're gonna say what should we do, uh, yes, at this point, I would like to wait until June to gather any other questions, but at this point, that would be my recommendation. Okay. So do, when, before we sign any contract, do we, do we discuss it with legal, or do we just sign? Well, so, no, talk. I, I ask, ask a question. It, it, it depends on the, on the depth of the contract. Okay. Um, so, for example, with our referendum contracts, we're talking 15 million. Mm -hmm. Yes, we ran that through legal extensively. Okay. When we're talking okay. about this particular instance, we had legal draft the language, but I've not had legal, uh, our own legal, mm -hmm. with our specific situation, run through what force majeure 10 looks like. As I put in the memo, it's only my interpretation. Okay, so I think we should have our legal seat, our legal people look at this the addendum, whatever, and tell us what our risk is. I think that, so through our, our meeting at SWSA, the board meeting this past, I don't know, third Friday, um, there's a thing called public purpose doctrine. Okay. Maui Falls brought this up. Dan Rossmiller, who's the um, WSAB, he's not an attorney, is he? He's the he's the, he's the attorney. attorney. So he said, don't, take my word as your attorney, but when you boil all it down, the public purpose doctrine says a public entity receiving public funds cannot pay for services not rendered. Mm -hmm. Now, we know it's gonna get a little murky there at the bottom because we're not paying for the bus drivers, but we're gonna pay for other things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something else we should uh, talk to the lawyer about. Uh, I am totally against what these people are trying to do to us. I, I don't, I write contracts every day. Seven, today I did seven of them. Now they're not to this depth, but when you set, so I had an attorney prior to making this form out for my contract, my work agreements, you put things in there that are for you. You, you, you write a contract, to protect yourself, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you negotiate with the customer thereafter. So right away when, when the CARES Act came out, their, nas their National Us so Busing Association came out and said, you, this, word, this word in here says you gotta pay everything, right? Because, so why didn't this company have in their agreement with us that some districts have that states you gotta pay no matter what. Were they not were, not, were they not practicing best practices? There's a reason why some companies have it in there and some don't. I can't for the life of me think of why we should pay other than being good people. When it first came up and I saw that the exposure that we could have to have to pay you know, uh, a quarter million dollars. And if you're gonna take that to your neighbor and say that's a good deal, I don't think so. I don't, I don't like what they're trying to do to us too. I, 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 I thank you for doing the work, Mike, and make, asking the questions, but they're sitting up here they, and I don't think they, I don't, I, I, they think they have the leverage and I don't think they have the leverage unless we allow them to have the leverage. So to your point, we did speak with legal today, 
and they said that just like we did with the last, we could postpone an actual vote on this until before July 31st. So it gives us time to answer those additional questions, go through legal, see what else plays out, and get more information. What what is July? What's it, what's so good about July 31st? It just a date additional that we discussed time. it before. That ideally, time. It, we should make a decision on the first <coughs> in June, in June, because of the fiscal year. We want to recognize the expenses this year if that's the route we go. Okay. July is just additional. It time. just gives us. So a maybe I'm the only one that feels this way. No, we have these votes that say pay it. And so I think. Yeah, I, yeah. I I got I got I take issue with how they're trying to do it too. I don't think it's right. I think our consortium dropped the ball big time when it came to this and. The other districts immediately giving in right away without really looking into, especially with Franklin just it's not going to their board. They're just going through, and that's what Green did. So, I mean, so it went to them, but they didn't make the decision. But ultimately, Greenfield is the same thing, right? They didn't vote on anything. Since you since you brought up the names, I'll say what's gone on so far. Okay. Greendale's board has passed it. When I asked, Greendale's asked, passed it. Yeah. Greendale's board passed it. Greenfield has not brought it to their board. Mm -hmm. Franklin has not brought it to their board. From what I understand, Franklin has not signed anything yet either. Greendale and Franklin, Greendale and Greenfield have. Well, even with what your suggestion is with we can do yeah. this and to September contract, yeah. they're still going to strong arm us. So if they're playing their cards this way right now, they're going to do the exact same thing in September. Said, so, well, you're not going to pay us the rest of the year, and when we come, we're going to you're going to be on the bottom of the totem pole again. And ultimately, I. I yeah, it's Wait. different. It's different, uh, just from the standpoint of everything's in place by September one. Yeah, there is there's so much uncertainty with September coming up. There's there's the difference in why I, I would argue we should be prepared for up through September. Once it, uh, routes are in place, drivers are in place, two week closures, we would be saving those dollars. But you couldn't just let drivers, you know, drivers would. Would be around. They wouldn't have time to get other jobs. Routes would already be well established. That's where I come from. The, the standpoint of why we would wait till <coughs> for, for September one and to not have anything else um, after that. If uh, if they're going to claim their argument, as you said, that you know the language is in our contract, but they honor other contracts, don't we have a a leg to stand on in that respect? Well, you can honor this contract, but you can't honor ours because they paid you and we didn't. How was that an act of God? So they all of a sudden say, well, we can't get you buses because you didn't pay us, but we can get them buses. It's well, there, you, they can't pick and choose between the yeah, contracts but, because but, of that. The, so listen, bu buses are a shortage, drivers are a shortage. Yeah. So if first student is struggling, they can manipulate buses and drivers wherever they need to go to meet needs. And they would simply say, this is go, go But Mike, uh, they're in the business of busing people. Yes. So yeah. if they don't bus people, they ain't making no money. A a agree. Agree. It's pretty simple business. But if they don't like our contract to begin with, if they're working on razor thin margins, if they've tried to renegotiate the language literally months into us particularly signing it, they might not have a major problem with dropping this particular contract. Maybe they go, you know what? It's been hemorrhaging anyway. We're done. But then what do they do with all those buses they have leases on that they're supposed to be paying for? I, I get it. I, I don't know. So there is two sides to it. It's, it's more there than are. just that. They, they have these overhead costs that they're telling us about, and they, they're, their only business is to serve school, school districts. Correct. And I don't think they have, I don't think they have <laughs> the, if you're telling me they're on razor thin margins, as they say, I don't believe say, it, yeah. but uh, they need our business <clears throat> just as much as we need them to service our needs. Agreed. I don't think okay. they don't want to, they don't want, it's not like they want, don't want to service. It, uh, right, I know Waukesha is not paying them, but is it, is it uh, Wauwatosa was the other school district? Wauwatosa was the other Or not Wauwatosa, or who, who's the other school district that uh, it was mentioned in the last one that said no to them as far as paying it? No, it's Waukesha, but there was a smaller, was it West, 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 West Milwaukee has not made a decision. Miami Falls, so on the conference call or with the, WS, the SWSA meeting, Miami Falls is choosing not to pay. However, they have a major construction project going on at a major intersection of theirs 
near the middle school. So they want that to be as smooth as possible. So they're going to pay their service some consulting fees to keep things smooth. That's what she said. How much? I don't know. Kevin, anything else? No. Okay. Steven? I have said none. So is it our understanding that the, the terminal that we're using is only split between us and the other ones you mentioned? So if for some reason we said no and the other two that haven't decided said no, in actuality it's only going to be Greendale that's going to get the From benefit of it? Or is yeah. it going to be more of you know, their whole umbrella of, well, we're going to divert all I mean, I don't see them doing that because they have that whole terminal, so they'd have to take a loss on that and, and do it that way. So essentially, if, if we said no and the other two said no, we'd only really be contending with them giving preference to, to Greendale, really. Two districts have signed. Yes. Greenfield Greendale and, and Greenfield. Oh, both have, have, okay. Franklin has given no indication that they won't. Okay, so we'd be behind the other two, but... Greenfield is the only, he, the only he, one comparable yeah. in size to what we have. To, to Quinn's point, are, are, are the buses already there? I, I'm guessing they're already there. Are they going to have? Are they going to struggle to bring drivers back? I don't know. Hold on. I hope they're there because that's one of the reasons why they say they need this 50%. Yeah. They're the, this is what did I say? <coughs> I hope they're there. They're there. Yeah. I hope they're there. <laughs> I hope they're there. Well, I mean, so I mean, I haven't driven by the because this is what they're telling us they need money for. Yes, to, to maintain buses, to maintain the buses. Just How they get drivers so, back. So they said, to, they said to maintain them, they didn't say to keep them. Pay leases, pay money on lease, I think it says. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Oh. Nancy? Mm. No? So many thoughts. <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, I don't like having to pay, but Yet I understand their point. I mean, it, it is difficult to get drivers. It was difficult to get drivers all the other years, and it's even more difficult now because the um, hourly rate has to be high now to, to hire people. So I'm sure they're struggling with that. Those of you who have been on the board for a long period of time know that every time we talk about busing contracts, it's a huge deal because it's very difficult and Drivers, there aren't enough drivers, there aren't enough buses. We struggle all the time with getting this done, uh, with contracts done. We should be happy, Quinn, that they didn't have this in the contracts before because then we would have been paying 50% when there were snow days and things like that. So, you know, to your point, I mean, we should be happy that they didn't have this in the contract until now. Uh, I don't like having to pay that, but, you know, I also kind of liken this to um, we're asking the the state not to cut our funding for uh, schools, even though we don't have any students in the buildings. Uh, we don't want our funding cut, and we don't want the people who owe us money not to pay us money. So I'm sure they want their money too. I don't know, it's a, it's a really difficult thing. I am not happy about paying it, but I think I would probably be inclined to. I would prefer to wait for a decision and. June and I kind of like Mike's idea to pay through September and or through August and and see what happens in September. Okay. Karen? I really appreciate hearing what everybody else has to say because it is such a difficult topic. Um, I have just a couple questions and so one of them is well what does it look like if we end up last? Is it going to be catastrophic to our service? Do we have any idea? Yeah. Um, I don't know what that means. Okay. We might have to get a school bus license. <laughs> That's not a good time of year for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. it's one of the things I wonder. So if we end up last, how, you know, what is the impact of that and what does that look like? So, so I, Karen, just to be clear, I don't, I don't know if we'll get a straight answer on that. Right, right. I, I'm, I, I guess I'm just kind of, you know. So my mind goes because this is how we have to, this is how I need to prepare. Mm -hmm. My mind, my mind goes to the worst, because that's how I need to prepare. Budgetarily, transportation, though, that's where my mind goes. So when I come to you with recommendations, it's because I'm thinking about the worst 
in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the other thing that trips me up a little bit is that the fact that we're obligated by the state to provide transportation. And so, Quinn, did you just say that Wauwatosa doesn't have busing? Mm -hmm. So how does that work? I mean, I don't know. Shorewood does not oh, they're work. on the city so plan? So Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, and, and Tosa do not. Um, Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, on, on there, because of their, if, if everybody is within two miles, then you don't have to. So yeah. that's one, one, one and, and Tosa, one square mile. Yeah. And so Tosa, uh, you can also rely on the city buses uh, for to them to augment their service if they provide that. And so that's an option for some of them. So, yep, that's how they do it. Okay. Yeah, and then my last thought is that, you know, I was really concerned about not putting our district on the hook for, you know, a quarter of a million dollars if for, you know, worst case scenario, we're not back in the school buildings next year and then we're just paying and paying and paying 50%. That really concerns me so I, I that's all I have at this point I don't know I mean I, I sort of like the idea of just doing a little bit and then reevaluate because then we might know more and see more of what things are going to look like but it's it's very difficult So okay. you're suggesting we wait until June, because <clears throat> June is um, like tomorrow. I would bring it up. We could either do it if we want to just act once. We want to bring it up only one more time. I would say let's just bring it back on June 22nd. If you want to hear responses first from, if we go the legal route and, and just then I can bring it back June 8th. We can continue the discussion. If there's responses, you might as well just, if we get responses, I'd rather just be emailed, and then we can just, I don't know why we need to bring it back two more times. Okay. I, if I, that's just my opinion, but I think if we're going to postpone it, or that's the plan, you might as well just do it once, and take all the time you need instead of having another one, so you I, I going no, through the same thing. I see no reason why we couldn't wait until June 22nd. If I find out something different than that, I would. I mean, if you're preparing for summer, if you're preparing for the upcoming school year, June 22nd answer would be fine to know. Um, and then that would give us plenty of time. But So instead of postponing through the end, we'll just say postpone until <coughs> June 22nd. Right? That would force us to act one way or the other. Yeah, on the something. 22nd. This is something. retroactive too, right? Should we go through with what your, your suggestion is? Retroactive through back when we cut, or we didn't cut bus, but back when school Back was from good. April 2nd is what it would be. Okay, thank you. So when they, when they initially came out, it was, will you pay 100%? Yeah, yeah. And so we bought some time and just did 90% for a week or two. Just because we're going, what is this? What, what are we dealing yeah, yeah. with here? And that's when we only thought school closures were for a week or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is there any... Uh, anything coming to what's going to have to do with it? Is, is there any um, DPI, WSAB, are they saying as to what uh, busing might look like? No. And the reason being? legislators who can come and change the law on any given day. I, I, I don't think that anybody can speculate that far ahead. Could it would, it, would it do us good to put a survey out to parents and ask them if the current atmosphere of the COVID-19, however you want to phrase it, is still lingering, are you willing to put your child on a bus with 50 other kids? Yeah, I think, uh, and I'll share in my report, uh, <coughs> uh, Lisa Elliott and I had a conversation with the, the local um, health department today about some questions about starting to ask, you know, where, where they are. Since I think last week's decision has really started to um, regionalize now because it appears that the state is not going to 
to make that, and they're trying to now say a local control, which puts a lot of us at tricky situations. But I think that question is interesting. We, if you sent out a survey, I would guess that parents would want more details in order for them to answer that question. And I don't have those details. Like, they're going to want to know, is it in every other day schedule? Is it, like, what does that look like? You know, how I get my kid to school, are you going to consider doing shifts of kids? You know, I, I work, but this isn't like, so I think I don't know that I'd be able to answer <coughs> the question that they might want to know in order to answer that question. I mean, you know, you have high school kids who, some of them can drive themselves. So that might be an option and, and whatever, but. So what, are, what is the administration doing to set a schedule for next year? We don't. <laughs> We're planning. Would it just be the time that you would be normally doing it? Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Right. It would be like, yeah. Are, we, are you going <coughs> as if we are starting on September 1st? Well, there's plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G right now. I don't know which okay. plan you want to look at, but sure. No, I'm, I'm asking that. That's, yeah, I, don't so need, I don't need to know the plan. Yeah, no, I mean, we have all of these, if this, if this. I think there's some speculation that at some point next year, regardless if we're back full face-to-face -face or partial, that there will be some back to virtual for a while as the second wave or whatever comes in kids. I think that that seems to be consistent with whomever we're talking to. Um, so yeah, we're talking about all of that, without a doubt. I will tell you that one of the concerns that we shared today with the health department is there's some talk about this A day or B day, you know, half the kids to try to minimize that. Think about this scenario. So if you have half of your kids on an A day coming to school, and then on the B day, parents who are working have to take their kids to uh, a daycare with 50 kids all gathered together, then they all come back to school the next day on the A day. Alternating days don't make sense. They're probably putting our kids more at risk because they have to go somewhere else, whether it's grandma and grandpa, or where are they, where are they going on that opposite day? Or we're encouraging you know, a parent who maybe isn't working or is at home to like, have 20 kids go over to their house because other people need to. So it doesn't encourage safe practices just because they're not here congregating. <laughs> it makes it harder for contact tracing if they're elsewhere congregating on opposite so, you know, we're trying to really think through all of the potential options of what that might look like, and um, so I, so we don't have a lot of answers. But kids have to get here regardless if they're doing it at you know fewer kids at once, or the same amount of kids at once, or lunches are just not together, or how do we you know in a room like this you can probably have six feet, but I mean, but that's not all of our classrooms or spaces. Do we start to use hallways and other spaces just because we need to spread kids out? But they still have to get here. So that's the bottom line number. And whether that's buses or parent transportation or walking or bikes or whatever it is, we're going to have to account for that and look at procedures. So. Well, I would like to talk, I was just going to ask a question about teachers, but I don't know if it, it can be under this. Um, you can ask during my superintendent's okay. report if it's not pertinent to this topic. It, 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 it is, but not directly to that seat. All right. So does anyone have any follow-up? Or is anyone opposed to postponing it a uh, decision until the June 22nd meeting? Yeah, it'll be the same. I just want to make sure that anybody has any um, feedback. Really quick, what Quinn said, I don't know about you said about a survey. I think at this point it'd probably be premature just given with all the constant changes. I think someone's opinion now is probably going to be a lot different come August. Not everyone, but probably. Yeah. Okay, then I'll take a motion to postpone uh, the action on the pupil transportation contract amendment until the June 22nd, 2020 <coughs> board meeting. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. On to D, BCPL loan. Uh, we will have to do a roll call vote at the end, but I'll take a motion to set this. So moved. Second. 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 Okay, and then discussion? Anything you want to add? Anyone else have any follow-up? 
Okay. Then roll call vote. Karen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Stephen? Yes. Kevin? Aye. Quinn? Aye. Jonathan? Aye. <coughs> On to E, waiver of instructional hours. Take a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second, okay. Uh, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. On to seven reports, superintendent's report. Um, I'll share again, as I have been doing some topics, and if people have questions or further elaborations, please do, or if there's something that I didn't address that you have questions on, um, please feel free to um, answer. I'll, I'll do the best that I can. Um, so right now, as we talked about, um, we're still continuing to move forward. I'll talk about the, the graduation piece of it. Those plans still move forward. Um, June 14th, starting at 1 o'clock, um, met with Charlie today to try to get some more details, going to contact the chamber for some things and, and get some information out there. Trying to time it, we're going to do a survey to students to see how many of them plan on participating in the senior succession. And we will have a stage that's available that the the, the senior can go out and stand on and one family member can stand by the car and take a picture from there but we can't have congregating and that's as far as, as, as what that looks like and so um, if people are going to do that we just need to get an idea because we'll talk about how we're gonna sort of pace and time people so we don't have more than congregating um, talking to the health department today we may be at groups of 25 or more but we can't we have to ensure that if people are doing that we're not creating um, congregating and and any contact that people on the stage are, are, are congregating around. So I'm uh, moving forward with that on June 14th, and so we'll get some more communication out there. Um, the July 25th date, as we talked about that, which we said is our plans are to start with a virtual graduation if things have changed um, that allows anything that might be safe. Um, we'll look at considerations. We haven't necessarily ruled anything out, but we want to be very safe and want to make sure that it's not exclusionary for people who you know do that we've had a lot of seniors email both Charlie and I with lots of great ideas and thoughts <laughs> um, and so we, we respond and appreciate that you know a lot of them have talked about doing it on the fifth wall field and so that's not something that we haven't considered and some of them are like even don't let our parents come just us we want to gather together one more time and you know you could spread us all out on the football field six feet apart and so um, it's not that we haven't considered that we just have to you know look at what's what's what we can do at that point. So July 25th seems like five years from now, honestly, and so it's really hard to even do that. But we put that date out there so it could be at least safe um, as we do that. Some dates for you to look forward. Um, hopefully you can participate on the 14th. On uh, June 3rd, we're doing a, a, a Facebook, um, we're gonna, a screening, it's called. It's the new, the, the new thing with Facebook is that we will have our A event, which is our athletics activities, academics, and awards for our seniors combined into one. Uh, and so you can, people can gather around and you know, watch that at home, but it will be released that evening and sort of that, that's our, uh, at our high school. And so that will happen on June 3rd. So we'll, we'll publicize that a little bit more. Um, June 12th, we will be uh, moving forward with our typical district staff recognition on that date. Um, it will be virtual, but all of you are invited to attend that virtual event. Um, we're still picking a time in that morning, so the, our years of service, we have a lot of people this year who are at the 15 years and then in our 25 year recognition. I um, had a great conversation with the district building leader committee at three o'clock this afternoon about some ideas on how we recognize staff moving forward. Um, this district has typically just looked at 15 and 25 years, and I said, you know, I sort of brought up why just those two milestones? Um, why not other ones beyond that? Or as we look at the, the concept of retirement, what does that really mean in today's world? And, and just that, because a lot of people may decide to either switch careers or, or what that means. And so it was a good conversation about that and, and what we could recognize um, at that, that part of it. So uh, that's that Friday, June 12th. Um, our, our elementaries are looking at doing um, probably that last week of school, their yearbook pickup, in addition to sort of having, um, as we did with the yard sign pickup for seniors, staff, they're helping with that distribution so families can see their teachers um, and also return any things that they need to, some technology and that, so making it a drop off, send off, if you will, so students still get that ability to do that. They've been tossing around a lot of options. 
Middle school is also going to look, we have yearbook distribution um, from 12 to 3 on May 28th for high school. They're going to see how that goes and then also do something at the, the middle school, very similar to that too. So it's sort of, we're trying to avoid lots of people, you know, coming back over and over again for things that they need to pick up and drop off. So <clears throat> as far as technology right now, we absolutely have to collect technology from our seniors. The rest of it is a, is a little optional. Definitely our elementary schools, we need to get that back, but there's not as much of an urgency with some of that, especially if some of it's needed over the summer for some, from, for some of our students. So that's a little bit more slow on planning what that exactly um, looks like. Um, let's see, summer school. So we've talked a lot about that. Um, last Monday when I talked to you, the plans about that, we've sort of paused a little bit on what we would call our second session. So first session is focused on middle and high school students who are getting incomplete so they can get that work done and that will be virtual and will be sort of a continuity um, starting on June 15th. Uh, a lot of districts have decided they are not doing summer school just because of the complications around it. Well, access to students who need it, transportation, will buildings be ready? a lot of questions on that and pulling that together in addition to just gearing up for the school year differently and because you can't use buildings prior to June 1, a lot of them are seeing some virtual fatigue, um, virtual learning fatigue from some students and teachers um, and it, it is working well for some at the same time. Um, we also know that summer school is funded differently uh, and so we have to be careful about what we some of the smaller groups that we're doing now that are part of the daily schedule by breaking out through intervention or some of those. Um, summer school is funded a little bit differently, so we need to spend some time looking at that part of it in addition to the um, access to students and families. So we know that summer school transportation is not provided for anybody, so that always, but when it's typically enrichment, then it's a choice of somebody to do that. If that's gonna be our main mode of um, filling in gaps of academic skills for students, then if transportation is an issue already, we're just, again, widening that gap of students who don't have access to that at the same time. So we wanna be very careful in proceeding with that piece of it. Um, so we'll, we'll put a little bit of a pause on that to decide what we can offer. Um, if we offer it, um, and, and survey parents when we get to that point. But right now, we need to make sure that our middle and high school students get those incompletes completed so they can move on to the next year. So that's our priority with summer school. Um, I think it was, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the reopening. Um, I don't have answers on that. Um, we are in constant uh, communication. We were in on a meeting on Friday um, with a senior policy advisor from DPI as, as well as the lead from School Finance Services and uh, good information. I always, I mean, I, I like hearing directly from the people who are making the decisions. Um, this week, I was hoping today, but I'm guessing in the next couple days, the Department of Health um, DHS is going to be putting up some more guidance on some uh, how to bring employees safely back into schools and what that looks like. And that's where that legal counsel jumped on. Um, our district legal counsel often also happens to be part of the larger group, which I appreciate because then I know whatever that legal counsel is saying, it's, it's Gary and Alana who are saying it, so I know that that's exactly what we're going to hear. Um, so now, uh, HR legal things are coming into about screening and not being discriminatory about whom you're screening. So everybody needs to get screened. For a while there was that point of, you know, if you're in a susceptible group, either with an underlying health condition or over the age of 60, you would get, you know. And so what does that now look like uh, to bring employees back, first of all, but then second of all, the bigger question is how do, how do we do that in the <clears throat> fall? If students come back and all of the contact tracing um, with students, like, it's one thing to ask an adult who hopefully can remember and keep track of that, but when you have to bring back thousands of students and try to keep track of that, is that even manageable? So we'll start to look at bringing um, employees back shortly. Um, those who we've given the option of working um, where, it, where it deems um, necessary to be able to do that. Some people have never left. Our custodians have always been working uh, some of our food service. So those are the next issues of what does that look like. Uh, what things around here need to change because of that so people aren't you know, congregating uh, as, as we look at that or, or right now we haven't thought about, we've added disinfectant um, things all over the building and um, different pieces of gadgets and things are being developed just like after the school safety stuff. There were lots of those door locks. Now you're seeing a lot of these 
split types of things for doors where you can open doors with your feet and all of this stuff as we would expect that to be. So we'll see how all of that is, but anticipate that our, whenever our staff do come back, there will be a lot of training around school hygiene and safety and what you have to do and expect of kids um, around all of that. I shared before that we met with the Greenfield Health Department today. Um, they meet daily, the local health departments uh, of Milwaukee County. And so we have two health departments, both on Hales Corners and here in Greenfield. Um, both Kathy and Darren talk with each other. So we met with Darren this afternoon and then he shares it with Kathy. Um, one of our biggest questions and the concerns with DHS orders were that um, they said the playgrounds were open as part of, of what happened, and yet school grounds are still closed. And so we said, okay, well, what does that mean? Can we open the playgrounds at our school grounds as long as, and so there's all of these now confusions when all of a sudden things just opened up and people didn't think about all the domino effects. Um, the park and rec also offers um, childcare, day camp types of things in which they can have 50 students. They can use our buildings because they do that, and yet we can't have kids in our buildings. So it seems pretty strange, all of these disconnects where different agencies at the state level are making the rules and then we're trying to figure out what that means. So the optics of saying, oh sure, the park and rec can be in your building with 50 <coughs> kids and you can't do anything seems a little strange. So um, we're gonna reconvene with him later this week to see what other districts are doing around that. And as you know, different county health departments and di different county governments are having different guidelines that they are giving and that makes it very challenging. Um, luckily, our district is only in one county, but you know we, we border very closely, six blocks away from another county, and so there's a lot of things that go along with that. Um, and so the questions about our facilities being open, such as our playgrounds or softball or baseball fields for or tennis courts for general public use, as compared to school use. So we are still closed through June 30th for any instruction or any co-curriculars or programs or events or anything absolutely clear cut on that. But opening the grounds for public general use as we normally do, that's a question mark. And so we've been trying to be consistent with both the Village of Hales Corners and the City of Greenfield when they closed all of their parks and all of that, then we were consistent with that. Now that they've opened them up, we don't know what that means. Um, so we're still waiting on that. So right now they believe, uh, so I think five of the six conditions they believe on Thursday, they will hit six of them, and so we will be into that phase, and so that mass gathering of 10 or less will change to either 25 or 50, and so that changes some pieces. Also 20, or uh, Thursday is the order with, which it expires, that, that one. Uh, the suburban Milwaukee is not going to be issuing another order after that one expires. And so you should just work with your local health departments on figuring it out what it is that you want to do. So they collectively, um, there is nothing else that's coming after that. So um, that was some stuff from the health department. Um, I'm going to leave it there and see if you all have any questions. I do. So have we talked to our teachers union <coughs> or had a teacher union talk to us about what they're feeling about coming back in their building and interacting with children? We don't talk to the teachers union about working conditions. Okay. The only time we talk to the teachers union if they come forward to us about negotiations. So I did talk to the district building leadership committee today a little bit about <coughs> what things look like, and that's the group that we talked a little bit about some of those things. We talked about parent-teacher conferences, school calendar, professional development days, and. Lynn joined us today. We had about 17 or 18 people who represent K-12, and it's representative of all of our buildings, and so we get their feedback. They're going back to their staff meetings this week and getting some feedback on even some of the professional development days. Do we want to move them out of August so we can take advantage of some of the learning we have this year? We didn't talk specifically about how they're feeling about coming back, but honestly, until we get more answers from legal counsel and HR on what we have to do to safely bring state staff back, it's a little premature to talk about that. Um, some of you may know that through, if, if a staff member requires accommodations through ADA, um, you're required to provide those accommodations regardless of cost. Um, cost cannot be a factor in which you can say that we can't provide that accommodation for you. However, there is a caveat with this new, with this 
virus that if somebody is asking you for something because of that, partly because it may not be available, some of the protest PPE may not be available. If that's a, uh, something that somebody needs, we can't guarantee that. And so that might now be a reason why you don't have to fulfill that accommodation if that's a need or some other accommodation. All of that, so now we've just sort of jumped into the HR legal piece about what that means and what proof has to be made, if any, to a staff member who said, I don't feel safe, or my personal beliefs don't want me to come back, or what do you, every kid in my class has to wear a mask, or I won't come back and teach, are they allowed to say that? So I don't think we want to enter into the conversations with our teachers of how we know what's even a reasonable question to be asking them, because if we toss it out there to ask them, and that's not even something that they have say in, then I think we've given the impression that they actually Topic or different topic? What's that? Same topic or different topic? Uh, anything related to the superintendent's yeah, report? Yeah, sorts of stuff that I haven't covered that you wished I would have, or decisions oh. that you're wondering what's no, going on. No, one of the things that I had asked about that I just wanted to get some clarification on was the reclassification process. Yeah, so there was, um, I know that there was some concerns about, you know, what does it mean to reclassify, that concept of reclassifying or retention or um, promotion, and so we have a board policy that relates to that. There's not a lot of details, but there is criteria on that, and so just to give a little bit of background on what that looks like. Um, previously, um, because it says fourth and eighth grade, and typically the reason that, that and that's, if that's a carryover from when the good old exam called the WPACE existed, and we gave that at fourth and eighth grade, and so that was the criteria that was used at those times because those were state standardized tests in which all subject matters were tested for all students. And so that's why fourth and eighth grade were looked at for that criteria. Um, you know, we give uh, the, the forward exam to all of the students at all grade levels, but it is comprehensive there. And, and the, the eighth grade is an entry into high school. Fourth grade is not the end of elementary, so it's sort of a strange grade to have in there. Those are some indications. Our, our district also uses some um, formative data, as you've heard us talk about the STAR and the MAP exams. Um, earlier, we used PALS exams. So those are the standardized exams that all kids get. They put us on a watch list for kids. Like either they are in, I think Lynn and others have shared that diamond, on the extreme high end of it that would have us look at, hey, this, this student may need to be accelerated, they're that advanced or a student that is consistently that low. We're talking the very, very tips of those triangles that would be in a consideration. When we find students in those pieces of it, we usually administer additional testing, both from a school psych parts of it, which could be social emotional testing, or it could be additional academic testing. Typically, um, the gifted and talented students get it, that um, will get um, additional testing at that level to see if they tr truly do um, meet that criteria. It's not the only one, but it is another level. So consistent scores, and we have the whole, you know, under our gifted and talented, what that means, if you're even considering acceleration. But we, we do not, we would recommend a great acceleration or retention without consultation with sites and often we will have the school site visit have conversation the parents fill out a questionnaire what observation do you have here if a child is at a daycare center what are you observing teachers fill out a form of what observations have you noticed in class usually at least the current year if not previously depending upon the age of the child so the data is our achievement data that we have consistently regularly we do look at grades although we know that those are probably the most subjective piece of all of that but we do have, like I said, school psych, that is the one thing they do is their diagnostics. That is the thing that they're trained in to be able to look at that data. So um, if a parent comes forward that they have concerns, it triggers some of those other pieces that we wouldn't have. But, it, but if, it, if it's not at all on our radar, and we have data teams that work really regularly, like if it's not on any of our data, it wouldn't be something that we would go and do just because. It was like, hey, the parent says, I think my child is either on one extreme or the other. If the data we're collecting doesn't point to that at all. 
I would say there is probably more data now around retention or um, advancement than ever has been before. And the social emotional piece is probably taking a bigger factor into any of those decisions than ever before. Um, and it is usually wanting to do that early on in a child's um, academic career when we're catching them rather than later on because it is much more of a social emotional impact the later you wait to do any of those things. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Thank you. On to eight board goals. A is legislative and advocacy, the SWSA report. Uh, yes, so we had uh, we had a combined meeting of superintendents, business managers, and board members. And it was a lot to do with um, advocacy and what different districts are doing with it. Uh, and uh, it was we had a guest speaker from NAMI, which is a, a national organization for mental health, right? Which is quite uh, uh, I don't say a hot topic, but. It's being really on everybody's mind as to because of COVID and, and uh, people sheltering and, and all that may come from it, uh, addiction, um, depression. Uh, so we have to keep an eye on that, and I'm sure we are. And then we had a board meeting, SWSA board meeting, uh, this past Friday, and talked about busing we, we talked about um, advocacy advocacy as well and uh, so you want me, everybody saw the letter that we intend to send to our uh, state <coughs> senator and three state uh, assembly people what do y'all think I guess my one question about it is you know what is our goal of sending the letter it seems to me that it might be just to like inform them, but I wasn't sure if there's a an action or or a position that the district would like them to take. No, it it it, 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 it is to inform them of what what's going on, as because they're not really in session right now. So when they go into session, that they have some background as to what we are doing and what we have been through, and. Uh, and hopefully be an ally for them and a resource for them for when issues come up regarding this, that they come to us and ask us, um, what do you think? So it's like more of a precursor to um, a lot that's gonna happen soon. And the, most, the more we can stay in touch with them, the better. Thanks. Anybody else? Well, I did see that there uh, talks about transportation in, in this letter. So that was my comment from mm -hmm. before that we're asking to not have our funding cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did see that. Yeah. And so we have those here tonight to be signed. So if we can do that before you leave, um, have you sign it and then they'll send it out. I think there was, Karen, to your point, there was a. Uh, and I think they also at the SWSA last Tuesday, they share, they've they asked all of us to um, share our story, as they're calling it. And so daily, and I can send you all, like there's probably 25 links. I just got another chunk of them now. They did this request to all districts across the state to tell their story. I think there's some concern um, that um, people, the invisible work that's happening right now that people are getting paid and, and that isn't happening. So a lot of the stories that people are sharing are about you know, providing meals and all of this other work that isn't being seen when teachers aren't physically in front of classrooms and sometimes telling legislators what's, what we're actually continuing to do. Because we are receiving funding, is really important that they understand that story piece of it. We took a little bit different angle and I think after Mike and I talked a little bit, we felt if we kept just saying, us to us to us too because it's the same story every district right is trying to make sure they're taking care of their underserved making sure meals are getting out there the mental emotional health and so we wanted to be very specific with concrete answers so it didn't to really talk about how we're addressing it and then the conversations that this board had whether it was around furloughing employees you know, 
we had the conversations. We didn't just go on and say we are, we aren't, or, or the busing contract. I mean, we've, we spent a lot of time and effort around those, those decisions because we take that very seriously. So it was important to know that I think sometimes they get the impression that we just thought it was business as usual and we're entitled to the money and didn't take time or to pause and think about it. And so that's why ours has a little bit different flavor, but we thought that the numbers and that made sense. Our story, we can, we can lay out that story. So part of it was that and to try to engage them um, in that part of it. And so we know that you know K-12 education is one piece of what legislators have to deal with. And so as much of it's our world and as deep as we're into it, they're dealing with Medicaid and transportation and all of this other stuff. So we always have to remind ourselves that, that they aren't legislators just for K-12 education and the more we can fill in the gaps for them. We saw stuff come out from the Wisconsin Public Policy Forum on fund balance and we know that that's been a topic before and we felt it critical to understand if they at all have it in their sights to come back and do anything related to school funding, that they understand that what was previously called tools or how the school finance formula works, that we can be, you know, really diligent about how we're spending the money, but if we get dinged on the other end of it because we decided to save it, right, this rainy day fund that they have at the state, if we decide to do that and we get dinged on it, then there's something right. Then we're going to spend money unnecessarily just so we don't lose state aid. And it was important that they understand that now before they get into a fast and furious, have to make some decision, go in and quick 24 hours, like there's a new law that we all have to follow. So. It's important to get them while they're in a, a low, low piece of it. So it wasn't necessarily a call to action otherwise, or, or it could have been, it can be a call to us. We're more than willing to sit and talk you through this at a level of, we'll help you understand it. So don't feel like you have to, we get that it may be complicated, and so don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we'll share with <coughs> you and sort of un to help you understand it. So when you do get into a caucus, you can sort of have your constituent stories tucked away when you're making and was lo losing uh, uh, <coughs> Senator Luther, Luther Olson is uh, retiring or has retired, who was the uh, the head of the uh, uh, education committee, and for the most part was uh, a, a staunch supporter of public schools. Um, that is going to hurt. He was a school board member, so he did time. understand that. He was able to bring that experience was as a school board member to the legislature, and so I would agree with you that mm -hmm. that will hurt us. Yeah, we had him a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago at SWSA, and um, he's very knowledgeable. Not all our representatives are, and uh, K-12 is the biggest piece of the pie, so we need to try and inform him as much as possible. Last Monday night, I'd said I'm going to move forward with 179 per pupil increase in the, in the budget. I, I heard enough just Tuesday morning to say that's not reasonable. Um, so I'm going to move forward with a zero dollar uh, per pupil increase. It's a, it's a significant swing, um, but we'll see. We kind of continue to look at those numbers. But I heard enough Tuesday to, to back that up. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So again. Before we leave tonight, make sure you all sign the letter so they can be. Sort of we have to sign it. Or don't yes. you have a signature? We have to sign we it. We have to sign it. This one we do. I mean, we have most. We did not have, I think, Jesse's or Karen's electronic yet. And so sometimes when we, the timing works out. Okay. I mean, when we don't, we aren't in person. We typically don't. But when we're here, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. On to nine items for future consideration. Yes. One thing that I mentioned is. Just with everything going on, my concern is making sure that we're not losing ground with our kids and wanting to keep an eye on things going forward. And I know that I talked with you about looking at, it seems to me that some of the state testing is too blunt of an instrument to look at exactly what we want in developing a district testing yeah. strategy to look at. Yeah, great. We, in fact, we just had some conversations this afternoon with some teams and folks and how might that look and, and really sharing with us. So yeah, I, I, Anybody 
else? Okay, 10 announcements. The last Edgerton PTO virtual meeting is Thursday night. <laughs> Anybody want to sit in for me, they're welcome. Get <laughs> your hands up over there. It's pretty fun stuff. <laughs> Anybody else? Have the other PTOs, have they just... I haven't heard anything about it. We just call it a day, huh? I guess. <laughs> the middle school's working a little bit, just kind of informally um, with... Uh, Mr. Antheline about like their eighth grade, you know, if they're going to do a back to school picnic or things like that. So there's been just a, like that kind of committee has been talking a little bit, but not. No, that's for, a they haven't had a formal meeting? Not a formal meeting, no. You lucked out. Yeah, you did for you. <laughs> okay. No other announcements? Then I'll take a motion to adjourn a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851C to discuss staffing. So moved. A second? Second. Roll call vote, Karen? Yes. Nancy? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Stephen? Yes. Kevin? Yay. Quinn? Aye. Jonathan? Aye. Thank you all. Have a good evening.